Okay, good morning, everybody. So uh, we have been discussing uh, K-means clustering in the general topic of clustering. K-means is a is one of the first uh, algorithms that you learn uh, when you study clustering. And uh, we said uh, among different kinds of clustering now here, this is a prototype-based uh, clustering algorithm uh, where you find some kind of centroids per every cluster, and the centroids allocated to the points based on nearest neighbor criteria. And one of the problems with K-means clustering is uh, it can yield empty clusters. So at the end of clustering, uh, some centroids may not have any points at all. So we looked at this example where we start with this uh, kind of seven points and uh, initially start with uh, the, these three clusters, uh, the red one, blue one, and green one. And finally, we found that, uh, so the blue one has no points at all. It's in the middle of nowhere. So in fact, uh, another, standard feature of uh, k-means clustering is the solution that you get may not be unique so let us illustrate that using a much simpler data set say i have uh, one point two three so all these let's say form a square i'm deliberately taking a very symmetric data set because it's easy to prove this so let's assume this is the origin and this is Point A, B, C, D, and these are you know points of a corners of a square. Sorry, minus one. So etc. Okay, can easily make it. So now if I take uh, two points, so call this M one, and I got equally spaced M two. Okay, so if I cluster this, what will be the points associated with M1? Can anybody guess? So these are these are the initial centroids, right? And then what do I do? I just allocate the nearest for every point, I allocate the nearest nearest centroid. So for B and C, it will be M1 will be the nearest centroid. For A and D, M2 will be the nearest centroid. So at the end of it. Uh, M1 will have B and C, and M2 will have uh, A and D. Now, next step, so this is the allocation step. Right, next step will be centroid computation. So M1 at the time, time step one, so this is, um, so, the, yeah, so this is time step zero, so time step one. M1 will be simply B plus E by two, right? Which will be minus one and zero. And uh, M2 will be A plus B by two, which is one zero, okay? So, so similarly, if you have, so, so right, so for M1 and M2 here, the way they are shown, uh, you will get M1 is equal to, this point m2 is equal to this point but on the other hand if you take m1 and m2 like like this so you have same thing sorry so let us say i have uh, a b c d and m1 and m2 is here Right, so then for M1, the, the points will be A and B, and uh, for M2, the points will be C and D, right? And therefore, final values of M1 will be uh, 0, 1, and M2 will be uh, 0, minus 1. So point is, M1, M2 could be very close to the origin. So it could be like, you know, initial values could be some point zero 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 one zero for M2, and M1 could be point zero, minus point zero 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 one uh, zero. So similarly here also for M1 and M2 could be zero and point zero 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 one, and zero and point zero zero, zero minus point zero zero one. So the thing is, in both cases, the, in, the, in case one and case two, M1 and M2 are actually very close to each other, but a small deviation can give you very different final clusters or final centroids. 
right so this is uh, so therefore the solution that you get in cayman's is not unique you can say the same thing in, in a different way so basically in case of k means you are trying to minimize this kind of uh, some squared error function okay and this function could have this is a very complicated cost function it depends upon all the centroids and the data set so it can have many minima and since you are basically doing some kind of a gradient descent are you trying to minimum of the this cost function but there's no guarantee that you will hit the global minimum so you can reach any of these things so in this case both these solutions are two minima and both are equally good in terms of their uh, some squared error so you will find one of them either of them so this is one issue and uh, the empty set pro problem also you can show using a much sim very simple example which is a small extension of the previous data set so again take your uh, points on a square uh, earlier you have taken your centroids as m1 m2 now let us take the third centroid which is somewhere in between so i'll call this m3 so now if you cluster this what happens for a and c right for m1 the the points in the cluster in its cluster are a and c for m2 the points in its cluster are b and d and for m3 obviously there is nothing okay so that's an empty cluster so you can produce an empty cluster very easily right uh, so this is these two are a uh, couple of problems that you immediately notice about uh, kemin's cluster so one way to solve this problem is uh, to update the centers incrementally because what happens in case of uh, kemin's is first you allocate all the points the centroids and then you update uh, the the center in one shot so that is for the entire cluster you update the center in one shot and so that what they are saying is for every reassignment right so whenever uh, you change the cluster centers so for every data point you assign uh, it to a cluster center right and uh, whenever a point jumps from one cluster to another whenever there is any change in the clustering right even by one point you recalculate the cluster centers immediately so so then in, in so when you do that uh, basically what you can do is when so so i have let us say two clusters here right and uh, this is one center and another center right and let, let's say one point here because of some reallocation one point here will move to another to another cluster and because of that let us say that will make this cluster an empty cluster i mean just say that's the situation then you don't do that don't make that transition right so that will force every uh, cluster not to be an empty cluster make it will make sure that no cluster is an empty cluster but this is more expensive because for every allocation of data point you, you know, for every data point you have to uh, recalculate the center it's pretty expensive but This is one way to make sure there are no empty clusters at all. But you might have clusters with very small number of data sets and you know, data points, maybe singleton sets, like where there is only one data point, which is also not not very good. Okay, so other things that people do to make sure this kind of abnormal distribution of data among clusters doesn't happen is to normalize the data set. So suppose you have uh, a data in which uh, one dimension is much bigger than other dimension. So let us say I have data where x1 x2 the values among x1 are very have wide span wide variation values among x2 are very have very small span so when do clustering over this uh, you might get a large number of clusters and some of them might be empty clusters and so on so in order to avoid that you normalize data so that uh, the variation in every dimension is same then you will get more globular distribution right so this is Okay, so after normalization. Okay, another thing is eliminate outliers because outliers are generally very far from. So if I have a data set like this, and if I have a data point like this, so that's an outlier. Now outliers generally will be sparse, right? They don't form part of any clusters. Uh, so if you have such a point, if you do clustering on this, 
you will typically find that uh, one whole cluster will be allocated to the single outlet that is part of out there right so obviously that will mess up your own clustering on the whole or you might have a centroid which is somewhere in between like this in the middle of nowhere it is neither taking care of this big cluster uh, you know not taking care of the singleton point okay? it's somewhere in between so in order to avoid such situations you there are ways of finding out layers and eliminating them then for some clustering algorithms right to make sure that uh, they they label certain points as outliers or noise so that they don't form part of the clustering process okay so in k means we don't do that we you know in basic k means we don't do that we just allocate all points to some clusters so then there is post processing that is eliminates small so once you you use lot of clusters initially take a large number let's okay uh, for clustering so k is a large number then once you do the clustering eliminate small clusters that might represent out so if a cluster so let us say some clusters have tens of thousands of points and some clusters have only three or four right and then uh, those small clusters are basically noise right so remove them and uh, do what all you want with those data points you maybe reallocate with the other remaining clusters so similarly split loose clusters that is you can have a very large cluster with sparse distribution then you know uh, then that's a loose cluster it's not really a cluster then you split such clusters so very small clusters you get it of them by you know reallocating those points remaining clusters Uh, or very large clusters you split them so to make sure that uh, all clusters are about the same size so merge clusters that are close so that they have relatively low ssc so nearby clusters can be merged so that uh, when you do that the on the whole the sum square error for such combination may not be very high okay so another way to do this is uh, there is something called bisecting k means which is a reasonably robust uh, algorithm for string algorithm unlike in standard k means where you you create you partition the entire dataset into k clusters right away right simultaneously you start uh, creating k clusters that is you initialize k clusters and keep on adjusting them until on the whole the clustering gives you a minimal uh, some squared error whereas in by by dissecting k means you start with only a single cluster and keep on increasing the number of clusters until it reaches the desired value k right so the starting with single cluster means there is entire data set the whole that data set is one cluster so then what you do is you divide it into two parts okay by taking k equal to 2 so you have two two clusters so here also you can have you can divide data set into many ways right uh, even though simple uh, data set of four points we have seen you can divide into two ways right horizontal or vertical so you can imagine that If you have a large data set, you can divide into in many ways. So do it in many ways, but among those different partitions, right, or bipartitions of the data set, take the one which has the smallest SSC. Okay, so so then you have the first cut, first level of division. Now you have two clusters, and among these two, take the one which has larger SSC and split it again into two, in the same way. Right, do a few trials and take the one with the lowest SSC. So now keep on doing this. Take the largest existing cluster, split into two, in such a way that SSC is minimum. Right, you make multiple trials and SSC is the minimum. And keep on doing this process until you have k clusters, and then you stop. So basically, you'll have something like this. You have one data set split into two, then they split into two, and so on and so forth. So to give an idea with an illustration. Uh, I have one data set. Initially, I have cut it into two, so I have two subsets. So the same data set we have seen before also. I think. So I have uh, two clusters. I have totally in this data set. You can see that there are ten clusters. And when I divide into two clusters, the first cluster, this one, right, has uh, six subclusters in it, and this one has four. So the which is okay, it's not a problem. So then, what we'll do? Then, since the left this cluster is the bigger one, right? We divide it into two. Okay, when we divided that, we have found two new clusters. One is here and one is here. And this one remained the same because we we didn't touch it in the second iteration. So now, so we have three clusters. The one this is one cluster. This is blue one. This is the next next cluster. 
and uh, the brown ones is a third cluster. Now you see that the blue ones is the biggest cluster. So split it into two again. So you, you get this. So now you have four clusters, one, two, three, four. These brown ones are the biggest cluster now. So split it into two again, you get this, All right? And uh, so now you see that uh, these two brown clusters are kind of you know, somewhat small. You know, it's difficult to make out which is the biggest among them, which has the highest SSC. So it turns out that this is at the highest SSC. So split it into two again, two again, two again, two again, two again. So by doing this, we found that uh, right, pretty robustly you can divide the whole thing into 10 clusters and identify the underlying 10 original clusters. So when we just applied uh, k-means blindly, we saw that this did not happen all the time. On some iterations, uh, we had we weird results where one of these tiny clusters is divided into you know, smaller clusters, or a couple of these large clusters were combined into even larger cluster, and so on and so forth. So we had all those problems. But with bisecting k-means, uh, to some extent, you can avoid those problems. But the only problem is obviously you have to cluster it so many times. Right, but it avoids some of the standard problems of k-means clustering. So there are several limitations of k-means clustering. It's not a very good uh, clustering algorithm in general. It's usually if you're looking at large data sets, high dimension data, and, uh, with uh, you know, very strange kind of cluster shapes and things like that. So for example, k-means will have problems uh, when the clusters are differing in terms of the relative sizes, relative densities, and if they have non-globular shapes. Because the problem with k-means is it's one of a prototype-based clustering algorithm. And in all prototype-based clustering algorithm, you have uh, a centroid and then you, you pick all points for which this is closest. So that is, uh, there is a kind of a preferentiality towards a radial or a spherically symmetric distribution, right? So, the, so therefore it cannot capture uh, non-globular shapes of clusters. Uh, so, and all another problem is outliers, we have seen that. The single outlier can mess up because it's based on averages. And whenever you have an average, uh, you know, outliers uh, can, can wreck your uh, solution. Okay, so this is an example of where the data set has very different sizes. So the blue is very small cluster, red is a very large cluster. And if you do that, split it into three clusters, uh, you can see that uh, it's completely, oh, sorry, there are actually three clusters here. This is one, uh, this is another. And you can see it's a bit pale. There is one more cluster here. So when they divide into three clusters, this cluster, this centroid, is, is taken a chunk of the brown one in the middle and combine it with the left cluster. Okay, the middle cluster has taken actually a part of the central one, and the right cluster has taken a part of the central one and combined it with uh, right with the right one. Okay, so limitations of uh, k, k means uh, another limitation is differing density. In this case, in the previous case it is a sizes difference in sizes. Here it's a difference in density because you can see that. The left cluster is somewhat large one, which is somewhat sparse. Among the right two clusters, the top one is uh, much has much higher density. The bottom one seems to have somewhat intermediate level of density. So when you clustered them, uh, so I can't make out uh, this and this. But anyway, these two are denser than this one. So when you clustered them, these two are combined into one cluster by this centroid. And this large cluster, which is sparse, is actually split into two. Okay, so it's so totally counterintuitive. Another problem is it cannot capture uh, non globular shapes because that's the nature of the prototype based clustering. Uh, so, in this case, uh, the clusters are present, but they're not spherical. So, the, each cluster is actually this is non convex data sets. Right? So, if you cluster them you know, with two in two clusters, Okay, it split uh, the upper part of this one and the upper part of this one together into one cluster, and lower part of this and lower part of this. Group. So, which is expected, that's the nature of k means. But that's obviously a limitation of k means, so you need to fix that. Uh, 
so when you have this kind of uh, situation one solution is not really a solution but it's more like a hack uh, you would divide into large number of clusters and then figure out how to regroup these clusters in a way that is intuitively more acceptable but that itself is another big problem so it's not really a solution okay so let us leave that um then one more variation of k-means clustering is called k-medioids right and it this occurs uh, when there is a special restriction on the data set so so in k-means for example you know that there are two uh, steps right uh, the two steps are so k-means step 1 is allocation right of data points to centroids step 2 is centroid calculation okay now in centroid calculation what you are doing is we are taking the average of all the data points in a given cluster so which assumes that it is possible to calculate an average and even calculate an average for uh, numbers or for vectors but what if your data points are not uh, vectors and not numbers Mm. No, what kind of data object is it which is not a vector? So, for example, take sequences. So, let's take for example, you know, biological sequences like a protein sequence or a genome sequence, right? And there also there is a notion of clustering. So, because clustering of data objects requires only uh, two things: that is, minimum, right, intra cluster distance, and maximum. in the cluster distance okay so this is all that you want to, to be able to construct a, a proper clustering and to be able to take care of both of them you need a notion of distance right notion of distance right so thing is i can have a notion of distance even when the data points are not vectors so for example if i have two sequences Right, I can have a notion of distance. There are ways of uh, defining distance between two sequences. I'm sure if you are in biotech, uh, if you have taken any course in bioinformatics, right, you have looked at a lot of these uh, sequence comparison examples or, or metrics. Or in computer science, also you said, for example, when how do you compare two strings? Right, uh, to have two strings A B C and A B X. Okay, so they are not different. Your string compare will give you zero. If x is replaced with c, you get string compare gives you one or something like that, right? Now the other ways of doing a string comparison, where there is something called edit distance. That is how many insertions, deletions, and uh, substitutions do you have to make, right? Because a string is a, a string is a string of symbols, right? So you can have you can insert a new symbol, you can delete an uh, existing symbol. Or you can substitute one symbol with the other with another. So how many such substitutions, the distinct operations, do you have to make to one string to make it identical to another string? So so that number of these operations that you have to make is called edit dis that edit distance. That gives an idea of how different the two clusters are. Two sorry, two sequences are. Right. So you have a measure of uh, distance here, but uh, how do you take average? Right. So I can't say. Average is equal to A B C plus A B X by two. Okay, so that's that doesn't have any meaning. It doesn't make any sense. So since there is no notion of addition of this data object, right? Uh, you cannot use k-means clustering. But clustering is meaningful because uh, you have a notion of distance, right? So so then uh, what do you do? So one solution in that situation is k-medioids. It's a bit uh, You know, computation is expensive, right? Uh, but it's a valid solution. So what do you do? Let us say I want to cluster this into k clusters. So then randomly select k of the n data points. The data points are the let's say things like the sequences. You can also apply this to even vectors. It is just that you are forbidden from using the averaging step. You have to do this, do it differently like this. You, you can never. Add or you know add two data points. If you have the restriction, and you follow this uh, procedure, then that is finding k-medioids. So what you do every uh, associate each data point to the closest medioid. So this is again the same nearest neighbor 
uh, criteria. That's the same thing. So then what do you do is for each medioid, uh, for each non-medioid data point O, swap M and O. So that means, so you have randomly select a bunch of K medioids and let's say these are all M's. Let's say MJ, so something like that, for MIs. Now, now you got a, you got some some squared error. Now you are searching for new possibilities for MI in such a way that the sum squared error goes even less than what it was before. So how do you find that new those new possibilities or new values of MI? Earlier you are re recomputing the average of all the points in your cluster, and you are recomputing MI. But now that is not uh, that is forbidden. So therefore, what you do is randomly pick a data point right and uh, which is not one of the medioids so instead of centroids we are calling them medioids right and then switch to two that is make m equal to you know, any of those any other data point randomly now recompute the cost okay if the new cost is less than the previous one you keep that difference you, know, you keep that switch right accept that if the new cost is greater than the uh, previous one Withdraw it and try to switch with some other data point. So, like this, most laboriously, you have to search if uh, any of the data points can be made equal to a given center in a given medioid in such a way that the SSC goes lower than what it is right. So, it is, which is quite cumbersome, but uh, let us see how it works. So, let us say I have some data points here, the 10 data points. Okay, so this is from Wikipedia, this article on K media, right? this is an example from there. So uh, we take two data points uh, as uh, medioids, initial medioids, that is at uh, 3, 4, and 7, 4. So these two, C1 and C2, are the initial medioids. Now you can cluster all the data using them. That is for every data point, so these are data points. See which is the nearest uh, medioid. So for these three, uh, C1 is closer, and for these three, C2 is closer. Right, sorry. So C2 has uh, one, two, three, four, I guess. Uh, so if the data point itself is included. So, okay, they're totally instead of one, two, three, four, five, in addition to this. So you take all five. Right, and uh, so these are two clusters. Now the total SSC is, you know, right, for every uh, medioid, take the sum of square distances of all the points in that cluster. So do the same thing for other cluster, and that's your right, uh, total SSC. So then what you do is, once you have that, take a given medioid, take any other data point, and switch to two. So for example, uh, let this select one of the non medioids O prime, that is with 7 3. Right, 7 3 is this point. Okay, now switch the C2 to 7, uh, C, switch the C2 to 7 3, right, and then recompute the total error and see if it is less than before. Right, if it's not, right, keep going, keep on going. So it's uh, pretty cumbersome, but in terms of results, it might be pretty decent. Uh, because in this example, you can see again, this is also from Wiki, right? You see in the upper row, you see the results with K-means clustering. So this is, so top row is K-means. Right up to here. And you see that the clusters are, the four clusters. This one, this one, I mean, if you intuitively look, look for clusters, you have four clusters. But see, and we have applied four centroids and say, see where they have landed finally. Okay, so two centroids are here in one cluster. This centroid doesn't have any cluster. This, sorry, this cluster doesn't have any centroid. This cluster also doesn't have any centroid. There's one centroid between these two clusters in the middle of nowhere. And only this one is, is captured perfectly. If there's a one centroid inside this cluster. But look at the other one, it is more cumbersome, that is, you know, you have to do more iteration, but also not too many extra iteration. And in this case, the final centroids are like this. Uh, so these are the four clusters. 
Okay, so each cluster, all the clusters are found perfectly. Okay, the centroids are found, or the medioids are uh, found this uh, clusters perfectly. So this is a medioid. Okay, so with that, uh, we just we are done with the k-means clustering. So let us go to another topic. Uh, sir, yeah. Uh, what's the significance between k medioids and k means? Like k medioids uh, have a have like a initial point which is like at as a part of that. Uh, no, no, no. As a part of that data. Right? We apply a special constraint, a restriction on k means, and then you get k medioids. In k means, you are allowed to calculate the average of a bunch of points to get the centroid. In k medioids, that stuff is uh, forbidden. Because k medioid is mainly meant for the clustering things like sequences, which where addition operation, the mathematical addition operation is not valid. Okay, but still, so there are data sets where clustering is meaningful. The idea of clustering is meaningful because there is a notion of distance, but uh, you cannot add points. Right? There's no algebraic operation of addition. So then, uh, how do you cluster? So this was k k medioids is a small variation of k means clustering, where you do clustering without calculating centroid in the way you calculate for k means. Is it clear? Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, no question. Uh, like uh, in the uh, like k clustering, very nice that uh, like uh, you you were just one like uh, method. That is so very nice So like how do we? Uh, sorry, that is a special class of so, k-means clustering called yeah. bisecting k-means. Yeah. So, uh, like, how do we initialize first point? How do we initialize yeah. first point if we bisect one cluster? Yeah, let me come to that. So, so take this example. Iteration one. Yeah. You see two clusters, right? Hello. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah, see two clusters. Like yeah. yeah. So you randomly take two points. All right. So let k be equal to two and do the clustering. All right. And that gave this so, this clustering. You start with k equal to two. See, you know that uh, probability of picking, uh, you know, different clusters that uh, k factorial. What is that? The k factorial by k k power k, right? Remember that uh, probability of picking initial centroid so that we have different. Yeah, this one. You know this, right? Hello. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you know this yeah, formula, sir. right? Yeah, that is the probability of picking right real clusters. If you have some k clusters in data set, probability of picking real clusters, if you randomly take from data set, is k factorial by k power k. If k equal to 2, that is 2 by 4 or half, which is pretty decent. Right? So if you do it a few times, half the times, yeah, you pick the right kind of clusters. If you have only two clusters. So in this bisecting k means you take only two clusters, k equal to two, and bisect the entire data set into two, two, two clusters. Now, even here, you know, your choice may not be great because the probability is half, it's not one. So you take randomly initial you know, centroids, this pair of centroids randomly, and uh, do this a few trials, right? Each of them will give you a different clustering, hopefully. Right, or sometimes it might even give the same cluster, right? Because after you allocate and you know recompute the cluster, I don't know, depending on the data set, you might get the same uh, clustering. Uh, but among them, you see which which clustering got you the smallest SSC. Okay, so take that as a starting point, then go to the next step. Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that is uh, you know, something about k-means clustering, and we looked at kind of shades of that algorithm, small difference in that algorithm. Uh, 
Next, let us look at uh, hierarchical clustering. That is, in K means is a flat kind of a clustering. So where you just divide entire data set into uh, some K clusters, which are all at the same level. But like I was saying earlier, in biology, very often you encounter data sets where there's intrinsic hierarchy. You cannot divide them all into a flat structure. So I mean, evolution and uh, you know the organization of species, species is a great example. Right, and this is called the tree of life where it starts from single cell organisms to multi-cell plants and algae and so on and so forth. So anyway, uh, or you can take uh, proteins, right? Proteins and cells form uh, classes. And very often you cannot uh, just put them all into one big basket or K horizontal baskets, but there are baskets within baskets. So you need to have uh, some, some kind of hierarchy. So for example, this uh, protein called P450 protein is a very large family of protein uh, with say, many clusters and subclusters and sub subclusters and so on. So that kind of data set uh, needs a different kind of uh, clustering algorithm. So that is a hierarchical clustering algorithm. So you can see in this picture that this, this uh, depiction is very interesting. So this is also a good example of smart visualization. So right, you see that uh, this whole clan two is one big. So this is actually a hierarchical cluster. You can see starting from here, right, it goes to two levels, right, and further that kind of splits into two levels, and so on and so forth. And then the tree goes down, down to very small levels. So see that uh, the same thing branches out here, here, branches further down, okay, goes all the way. So you see that uh, basically if you, if your tree is very complex and uh, then the lower nodes, right, if your tree is very complex, the lower nodes will occupy a lot more span, right, than your uh, higher nodes, right? So, so the thing is, it's very unwieldy to draw very large clusters like this. But suppose you, you twist this and uh, organize all the leaf nodes on the circumference and the root node in the center. That's a very nice way of utilizing the area, right? Otherwise, uh, you'll end up taking a lot of space on the paper because when you draw a picture like this, in this picture, the upper part is all empty. It's not utilizing the area you know, effectively. Whereas in this picture, only a small core in the center is empty, but otherwise, because there's more area close to the peripheries, right? Because the area increases as R square. So there's more area in the peripheries. So they make use of uh, that area in, in a more effectively, more efficiently. So this is a much better way of visualizing a tree structure. Right, so how do you construct this kind of hierarchical clust you know, clustering? Uh, uh, how do you perform hierarchical clustering of a given data set? So what you do basically is uh, you have nested clusters, unlike in K-means where all clusters are non-overlapping and they completely partition data set. In this case, the clusters are totally overlapping because that is, so we have clusters within clusters and at the highest level, the entire data set is, is, is uh, described as one big cluster. Right, and then that will have smaller clusters and so on and so forth. So you progressively divide that into smaller and smaller clusters, right, until you reach a point where all the individual data points become in, the, in a separate clusters. You can depict them as separate clusters. So what we have done with the bisecting k-means, right, just a few minutes ago, is an example of a hierarchical clustering. But the only thing is in bisecting k-means, you don't go all the way uh, where the number of clusters is equal to the number of data points. Because in bisecting k-means clustering, it's basically it's a k-means clustering. Therefore, your aim is only to produce k clusters. Your aim is not to divide entire data set all the way to the single points. Whereas in hierarchical clustering, your aim is to go all the way from a large cluster where all data points are present to a very fine-grained clusters where every data point becomes one cluster, separate cluster. 
Okay, so when you do that, you call call it a hierarchical cluster. So in in that uh, so in such a, uh, a kind of a clustering, there are two ways to visualize it. One is using this kind of a you know, Venn diagram kind of thing. Uh, but uh, this is okay if your data set is two dimensional, you can draw nice pictures. But in general, this is not so. This is only for two D data. So in general, you can't depict like this. Right. Another way is to depict uh, like this kind of a explicit tree, right? And uh, so where you can just so these points can be depicted on the x-axis as in as at discrete positions. So when I say this is one, this is three, this is just identity of the data point. It's not saying anything about the values involved in that vector. Okay, this is just an identity. It, this picture is only saying that in this kind of a hierarchical clustering. One and three end up in the same cluster, and they are merged. Two and five end up in the same cluster; they are merged because you can see the same thing happening on the in the figure on the right side. One and three are in the same cluster. Two and five are in the same cluster, and then two this cluster called two two five is combined along with four, right, to form a bigger cluster called three. Then this cluster three and this cluster, which is cluster number one. Okay, are combined to form cluster number four, right? Which is this big circle. And cluster number four, you add data point six to cluster number four, right? To get the, then the largest cluster, which is the entire data set, that is cluster number five. Okay, so what you have done here is we start with one and three, combine them into one cluster. Then to go to two and five, combine them into one cluster. Then add. Data point four to this cluster five two, right, and combine this and that data point four into one cluster, right, and then that cluster which consists of now three points is combined with one and three uh, at this level, and at this point what you got is nothing but this cluster four, and to this cluster four you add this data point six which is shown here. Right, and uh, so that is added. Uh, and you get this final single cluster, which is the five, which is the whole whole entire data set. So this is how the hierarchical clustering works. But we haven't said anything about the basis by which you combine points like this. I mean, why are we combining one and three into one cluster? Why are we combining five into another cluster? And why are we combining it to four? Right. So this we will see as we you know as we go along. So the strength of this uh, kind of a hierarchical clustering is that you do not you do not assume any particular number of clusters. So the weakness of k-means is that it doesn't tell you how many clusters are actually present because sometimes when you see the data set, at least in two D you can make out. Uh, that uh, there are intrinsically certain number of clusters in data set by visual inspection and very often you can do that now higher higher dimensions also you, you can you can be sure that there are such clusters but obviously you cannot intuitively just you know make out what those clusters are so there is a notion of intrinsic clusters but in k means clustering uh, it doesn't capture those intrinsic clusters present in the data set you have to specify the k and then it will give you So many partitions or clusters in the data set. Whereas in case of hierarchical clustering, you don't have to assume any such particular number. But the problem here is here also it doesn't commit to any particular number, right? K-means clustering doesn't tell you how many clusters are there. You have to ask for it. And the hierarchical clustering also doesn't tell you how many clusters are there. It will give you a clustering solution at every number. It says, okay, if you want one cluster, I'll give you, which is of course trivial. That's the entire data set. If you want n clusters, also I'll give you, which is putting every data point in in a separate cluster. So that is kind of useless, but uh, it gives you a way of finding k clusters also, right? From a variation of hierarchical clustering, I will later on show you how you can get a solution where it prescribes certain ideal number of clusters, right? It prescribes a number k, which it says is the ideal number of clusters present in data set. So we'll see that later. So, so in, the, in hierarchical clustering, you can divide the entire data set into just one cluster at one extreme, 
and all the n clusters where n is the number of data points at other extreme. And once you have a tree like that, I can always cut this tree at various levels and I get different number of clusters. So for example, if I cut this at this level, I get one, two, three, four. I get four clusters. If I cut it at this level, I get two clusters. So two. If I cut it at this level, I get one, two, three, four, five, six, six clusters because it's all all data points. So uh, I can get any number of data points, any number of clusters that I want because uh, by just cutting it at various levels. But the algorithm itself doesn't prescribe uh, how many clusters are there in the data set. But this kind of clustering is uh, maybe more meaningful to capture taxonomies, uh, which are very common in biology. Here, when it comes to actual algorithm, which will let you construct uh, a tree structure like this for a given data set, there are two main kinds of algorithm clustering. One is agglomerative. Right, uh, where you start with the number of points as individual clusters, and then that progressively combine them, which is a, which is more like how I described this process just now. That is, I said we start with one, three, combine them. We start with five, two, combine them, and we keep on going until we put all data points in one one large cluster. So that kind of a clustering process, or hierarchical clustering process, is called agglomerative clustering, where you start with individual points and keep on merging them until you put all the data points in one cluster. The opposite of it is divisive, where you start with one huge cluster and keep on splitting it, right, until uh, you get to a point where every point is a separate cluster. Or like in, K-means, like in case of bisecting k-means, you started with this uh, single cluster, which is the entire data set, and you kept on splitting it, until you find only k clusters. So either way, you can, you can do it. But that is called a divisive hierarchical clustering algorithm. Now, uh, traditionally, when you say hierarchical, it is it is we mean more often agglomerative, uh, and uh, we use some kind of a similarity or distance uh, measure, right, to, to calculate this, to decide whether you know where to merge. So the algorithm goes something like this. Um, so actually, let's look at the time. OK, I think we're almost done, because this uh, algorithm takes a little bit of time to explain with an illustration. So let us pause here, and let's uh, get back to this tomorrow. OK, any questions on this? Uh, so not on this, but uh, yeah, sir. Uh, sir, yeah, I still don't understand, like, yeah. Yeah, sir. I yeah, Kishan Kumar, yes. So how do you, if you check, if you check, sir, like how we decide uh, how, like uh, which point go in particular? Do we, do we use k testing to decide that? Yeah, that's, that's what I said, right? In, because it is bisecting k means question. The bisection is done by k means question, where uh, k is true. equal to 2. So right. if we are using so why do we always dissect in two parts? We can divide it. No, 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 no. There's only one special category of one special category of k-means clustering called bisecting k-means clustering. There you there at any given stage you divide data set into two. That means for that subset you take k equal to two. Yeah, right. So and then do the clustering normally. What is the confusion? I don't understand. You go through the slides once and ask me again tomorrow. Uh, yeah. okay, somebody else uh, also had a question. What was it? Can the shaker, right? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, um, I was asking about the when will the quizzes be? Oh, God. Quizzes will just go with the flow. I mean, when is the official quiz schedule? It's not been announced yet. Sometime first or second week of March. Okay, sir. Right, yeah. Any other technical questions?
Um, I have a quick question. In uh, yeah. K-Medioids, uh, mm. in the swapping step, uh, do you swap uh, the medioid with a different uh, non-medioid point in the same cluster, or can you swap with any point in the data set? Either way is okay. There's no restriction. Okay, will no, clustering happen just... faster if you swap within the same cluster? I can't say. Uh... Because because when you allocate to a different point, that might radically change the clusters in the next step when you reallocate by nearest neighbor. I can't say in general. Okay. Any other questions? Sir, I, sir last Mission class video ended in the so, Sorry. Last class sides are not uploaded. Last class video video hasn't been uploaded. No, no, last, uh, uh, last class, it was a tutorial class. So I have uploaded the document and the video, the, uh, we were doing it in the Jamboard, no? So the Jam, Jamboard will be, that uh, PDF will be made available to you. Okay. So already it is uploaded in the Moodle. The, uh, the solution, uh, exact solutions, uh, you try to solve it, the remaining questions on your own. And after that, we will supply you the solutions. Okay. So see you tomorrow. Yeah. See you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.